a seven and a quarter inch gauge Sweet William steam locomotive part six. Before the boiler is removed for pressure certification, I need to see how the engine runs with the Hackworth valve gear in the correct position. What do I mean with the Hackworth valve gear in the correct position? Once the boiler is lifted off the frames, the engine will be a lot lighter. Initially, owing to the weight of the engine and the stability on the bench, it is sitting on some very strong wooden blocks, so consequently the wheels are not touching the ground, which means that the axle box suspension springs are not being compressed and the axle boxes are right at the bottom of the slots. This type of Hackworth valve gear with the rocking shaft needs to be set up when the engine is at its working weight and the axle boxes in their working position. This is one minor disadvantage of this type of valve gear. But generally speaking, once these engines are on the track with the boiler full of water, they run around without any problems. Currently, I'm waiting for the customer to arrive to take the boiler away for pressure certification. It is the morning of Tuesday the 11th of October 2022, and normally in the mornings I edit the video footage from the previous day. But today I need to take full advantage of having the boiler on the frames and then having the boiler off the frames in the same morning. You've just seen me lubricating all of the moving parts. What I'm going to do is run each side of the engine and see how it performs. I had to make a suitable adapter to allow me to feed compressed air into each side of the engine. How did I do this? I found some fittings and where did I find them? in my box full of old plumbing fittings. Very quickly, I found a couple of fittings that suited the job perfectly, and here the compressed air is attached to the engine on the right-hand side only. Whenever I work on twin-cylinder engines, whether the stationary engines or locomotives, generally I try to work on each side individually, and once I know that each side of the engine runs perfectly, I know that both sides will work together in harmony when compressed air or steam is applied to both of the steam chests. It's obvious that the engine is still elevated, so the axle boxes aren't in the right position. I just want to see how it runs at each side like this. take this opportunity to show the twin water pumps mounted between the frames. This engine is running rather well considering the position of the axle boxes. The problem is that this engine has steam operated cylinder drains. Here are the pipes and you can hear them blowing. This is a very leaky tap mounted on the brake column that is designed to send steam or air to the cylinder drain cocks. I'm removing the union because what I want to do is push a piece of silicone rubber tubing like this onto the pipe and you can see the pipe moving when I admit some compressed air to it. I have a special distribution unit and I'm using two sources of compressed air from that. The larger diameter silicone rubber pipe admits air to the steam chest and here once again you can see it running and the drain cocks are still blowing. But when I open the second valve on the distribution unit to let some compressed air to the cylinder drains, they immediately close and stop the air from leaking from the cylinder. I can't resist it any longer. I have to remove this paint. And you can see I'm just scraping it off the piece of metal using a steel rule which is making a mess. And for that reason I'm now using my vacuum cleaner. So it's not making a mess. I really can't live with this paint. Look at the state of this, there's been no attempt at keying the steel. At first I thought, oh it must be stainless steel, but when I tested it with a magnet, it's definitely magnetic. So no, it's not stainless steel, it's just a piece of ordinary steel that hasn't been keyed for the paint. Once the boiler's taken away for testing and certifying, after a short pause while I get on with some other jobs that are overdue, I will be continuing this job, which will take a while, I mean this is nothing. I'm cleaning up the burrs on the drilled holes using my angle grinder fitted with a flapper wheel. Both of these plates will be removed and I won't paint them immediately because I need to drill some holes in them for a water valve for an injector and various other jobs. 
One thing I am going to do is look at the piping of this engine, which is diabolical. Almost everywhere where there is a pipe and a union, it leaks. And the balancing piping between the tanks was a very strange arrangement. It was soft-soldered and literally fell apart while I was undoing it. I'm also going to fit a tank drain, because at the moment there's no way of draining the water from the side tanks. Time for a bit more one-sided running. Don't forget there's air only going into one side of this. I've opened the valve on the distribution unit to let some air to the cylinder drains and it's running very smoothly and very slowly, in both directions. This engine is really well made. The initial machining is very good indeed. My theory is, I think that it just became a bit too much for the builder. I mentioned in a previous video that I built one of these a few years ago and I stalled on it too. I never completed it, I had a copper boiler and everything, but I sold the lot. What I'm doing here is moving my air inlet adapter to the other side. To seal this union, I used a short piece of silicone rubber tubing inside, which worked very well. And I'm pleased to say this is one of the few connections on the engine that isn't over tightened. Very soon though, all will be well because I am going to repipe this engine fairly extensively. I've opened the steam valve to the cylinder drains and I've just heard them shut. And when I open the other valve, this side of the motion also runs very well. I fitted a hand wheel to the lubricator to replace the nut that was on there because you couldn't tell when it was turning and when it wasn't turning. And it seems to be fairly reliable, but it does have its moments when running slowly, often it stops turning. This needs some attention. By way of a change, I'm viciously attacking the paintwork on the other side. And as before, I'm also removing the burrs from the drilled holes and using my workshop vacuum cleaner to get rid of the debris. It's looking a whole lot better already. As I mentioned earlier, I will be removing these parts to paint them properly. So far, I'm quite pleased at the individual performance of the valve gear. I think it's time though to remove these brass oil reservoirs from the side tanks. Once again, the brass threads were very tight, but I'm not going to ramble on about that. When we had a close look at the boiler, there were various marks on it saying top, front, back, and that was professionally made, and the welding standard on it was excellent. The welding standard on the side tanks is pretty good, but not as good as the boiler, but nevertheless far better than my welding attempts. This is the other brass tank, and as you can see, once again I'm having to spanner off the nut all the way. This is a real pain, just down to being over-tightened which distorts the threads. But eventually, these rather well-made brass tanks are both removed from their mountings on the main side tanks. Looking at the construction of these tanks, I wondered whether they were designed for wicks, but I don't think so. If the tanks had woolen wicks going down the holes into the pipes, then what would happen would be a constant flow of oil into the pipes, into the axle boxes and out onto the bench. Both of these internal brass pipes are coned, which is perfect for applying the point of a pressure type oil can. The tank itself just catches the overflow from the oiling operation. That's my theory anyway. I'm a bit concerned about these side tanks. Normally they're made from copper or brass. These are made from welded steel. And it's not stainless steel, I tested it with a magnet. When I look inside using a torch, I can see evidence of someone trying to paint in there. But to play safe, I'm going to buy some of this stuff that you put in motorcycle tanks to seal them. And I used some with a friend of mine on a motorcycle he was building. And I remember at the time thinking that it smelt very much like hammerite paint. As my back is feeling a lot better, I lifted the back of the engine. This is very, very heavy. I had to lift the back of the engine with one hand and then slide the rolling road underneath the rear wheels. By using a crowbar that I inherited from my late father, this was a very simple job. And the rolling road is now underneath the rear wheels. I went round the front, which is not quite so heavy. I lifted it manually, then I inserted the crowbar. Then, as before, I used my other hand to make sure that the rolling road was under the wheels. 
and once the rolling road was in the right position, I simply lowered the front. Time to turn on the compressed air and hear the difference. The first thing I noticed was that the knocking noise disappeared completely. It wasn't quite so even in reverse, but I think it will be okay. With the smoke box, side tanks and cab in place, everything should be okay. Here's a bit of slow motion. And now a quarter of normal speed. The squeaking noise you just heard only occurred when I dropped the pressure. And that is it for this episode. The boiler has been strapped into the van, ready to be taken to the boiler tester. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website, and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.